Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about deep learning needs pro visualization. Uh, so we, I'm mainly working in the area of visualization or scientific visualization. So there has been a tremendous uh, kind of exciting advance in combining deep learning with visualization. So there's uh, basically two ways to do this. So one is they are using visualization to open the deep learning model. They used to try to you know design the visual analytic technique to they call it open the black box, right? Allow you to see the primaries and also stealing the uh, deep learning uh, like data trainings. So the other direction is using deep learning for visualization. So it's more in line with traditional like computer vision technique using deep learning for for solving complex or difficult tasks. So I'm mainly working in the second second areas. Uh, I will use a few slides to briefly introduce you to the pro visualization concept. And we will then talk about two recent work in my team. So we are working on the uh, auto encoder framework that can learn the flow line or surface feature implicitly and use that for uh, clustering and representative selections. The other technique is on the vector field reconstruction. We are using the uh, super, super resolution technique for images uh, to achieve that. At the end, I will use the slide to point out the future directions. So these are a few examples of the flow field. Uh, some of them are we are seeing on a daily basis, like smoke, and the other are maybe from the ocean column from outer space. Uh, as you can see from the satellite images, uh, if you drive a car, there's a, a airflow go through the car. You see a lot of uh, flow traces. Um, so the image on the on here is the they call the wave vertically. Normally you don't see it. So the NASA used the color mode to uh, uh, at the at the runway so that you're able to see the strong uh, the turbulence uh, at the tip of the of of the aircraft. So. And flow visualization is used to um, display those information quantitative and quantitatively. So by definition, the flow field is a vector field. So in 2D, right, as every grid point, like as y, you have a, a direction and magnitude information. So like scalar field, uh, vector are also defined as a discrete point. There are basically a few techniques that can be used to analyze uh, or display the flow information. The first one is called grid-based method. So this basically uh, render each individual vector in the field. So just like hedgehog, so you can just show the orientation line, sprite over the volume, indicating orientation and the magnitudes. The other one is just use a glib, right? Using the arrow icons, showing the directions. Okay, but you lose the continuity information. Okay. The second technique is called the texture-based techniques. So it's use very dense textures like the line interval convolution. Uh, to visualizing the uh, the flow information, so this is typically used. It's useful for for two D flow or the flow on the geometry, like the uh, the surface of the space shuttle here. So if in three D, it will be very cluttered unless you do a cutting plane. You are able to see uh, see through the volumes. And most of the time, we are using what we call a geometric based technique. This is where you place a sieve in the domain, and assuming you know the sieve will be driven by the flow field, and we can add that the C forward and backwards to trace what we call the string line for the steady flow, or um, in 2D will be the string surfaces, and 3D will be the flow volumes. So this is uh, just a quick example of uh, how you do the string line tracing. So this is a discrete domain you have here. Okay, so you play the C uh, in the domain, and then you follow the flow direction, and reverse direction, you're able to trade the forward and backward, the continuous impression of the, of the flow field. So every point uh, you trace along the string line is instantaneous tangent to the underlying flow field. And if the flow field is unsteady, meaning it's changing over time, then you're able to trace what we call the path line. So basically you are doing the same thing, but at every time step, you're using a, uh, the flow field at, at that particular time step for the tracings. And these are the sum of examples from uh, the research in my group. So uh, you are seeing here the tornado simulation of the flow surfaces. And at the bottom, we have a dense flow line showing the patterns. And this is just showing you the flow surfaces and a few of other examples using the string surfaces. And this is the bundling of the uh, string line of the, of the supernova data set. 
So a good question in flow visualization is where to place the seed, right? So uh, because in 3D, it will be easy to lead to clutters if you don't place the seed well. Well, with the good advance of the you know, computing technologies and with the, with the fast computers, you are able to render random using a, not a large number of random seed, seeding, right? So you can render like thousands of uh, string lines on the surfaces and the question now becomes from those surfaces online, how are you able to pick the representative one? So the flow net is the one of the 10 we did recently. That's uh, what we at attempt to do is to, using the autoencoder to, to kind of uh, do dimensionality reduction and compress the, the complex each of the surfaces or the flow line into uh, a feature vectors, okay, in the latent space. And here you are showing you a multiple dot, each dot representing a flow surfaces in your space in the original space, and we're able to do clustering in this, uh, uh, in this uh, reduced uh, feature space, and we do dimensionality reduction, and using the TSM to show, show the distribution in a 2D, we allow you to actually to see and select those, um, uh, you can cluster those uh, surfaces, and also find uh, representatives. So the outline of FlowNet uh, it's a uh, web aiming to design a single framework that can handle both the line and surfaces. Okay, so that this has nothing to do with the uh, is line input or surface input. We have to handle them in a single framework. The idea is to use the autoencoder to automatically learn the line or surface feature descriptors and using dimensionality reduction techniques and entire clustering for exploration and selections. So these are the user interface. Um, so on the left, you see a, a bunch of uh, string line rendered in the original spatial domains. Okay, so it's very dense because we have to find representative from this dense set of line. On the right is a projection view where each line on the left is represented as a dot uh, in a projection view. And we do dimensionality reductions. And as you can see, the proximity of the point representing the similarity uh, of the line in a, in a 3D space. And we will see in a demo here. And here we're able to do the cross strings. And you can select on the, on the right hand side and click the cluster and show them. Uh, you see the multiple cluster here is to show them uh, in, the, in the original spatial views. You are also able to select just uh, a smaller regions, OK, and highlight. Uh, uh, so this is what we call typically called Russian linkings. Again, so the projection will become a user interface allow you to navigate through these uh, 3D uh, string lines. And here I show you the example of interactive, interactive clusterings and we, for each cluster we find a representative. So on the left side you show you uh, a different level of detail of the, of the uh, reduced set of string lines that uh, represent the underlying flow field in a more uh, visually um, clear manner. So the basic thing we are using is the framework. So each of these uh, either line or surfaces, what do we do we, is we discretize them into a 3D binary volume. So basically for every voxel, it is one means this, this voxel, right, corresponding to a, a point on the surfaces on, on the string lines. Okay. If it's zero, means that there's no uh, surface or point information at that position. So we use uh, uh, encoders to encode this 3D binary volume into a uh, latent feature. And then we do the decoders, try to reconstruct the binary volumes, and we are able to use that to compare with the original binary volume. And this is a design for the loss and uh, used for the network trainings. So you may ask, why are you using this voxel-based approach? There are actually different approaches that can be leveraged. Um, in computer graphics, um, people are mostly using the manifold-based method. Uh, but this is normally suitable for 3D mesh uh, manifold, which has a gene of zero. Right? So they can be mapped to a spheres or higher gene surfaces. But this actually does not work on the flow surfaces, because they are not typically non-closed surface. Uh, and flow line is a degenerate case of flow surfaces. And the other direction um, is using what they call the multi-view techniques. Basically, they kind of take a camera and take a multiple shot from different viewpoints and use that uh, 
to represent a 3D shape with images, okay, uh, rendered from different views. Uh, again, it's not actually quite suitable for us because, of, as you can see, the flow surface itself is very um, complex. It could be severely occluded uh, even for single surfaces, okay? So you are able, not able to capture from the outside view, from the external view to capture everything uh, of the surfaces. So therefore, we go for the voxel-based approaches and because what we really need is not a precise representation of the line of surfaces uh, for the loss function design or the reconstruction quality variations. Uh, but this approach kind of has its own limitation because uh, due to the <coughs> current power of GPU is normally is limited to a very low, uh, typical low resolution, like 64 cube, but it's not a, a big issue for us. So the design of uh, the autoencoder or decoder, uh, the, so encoder consists of convolutional layers, okay? Uh, the yellow one you see on the top and followed by the batch normalization. At the end, okay, we have uh, one com convolutional layer with, without the batch normalization. Eventually we have a two fully connected layer. And so again, you can kind of compress those line of surface representation into uh, feature vectors and decode the reverse that process. And we apply the rectified linear unit functions at the hidden layer and use the sigma function at the upper layers. And we consider three different loss functions, cross entropies, uh, the mean square arrows, and the dice loss. And eventually, we select the, the binary cross entropy because this gets the best uh, performance. So once you have compressed uh, or encoded each line of surface into the feature vectors, you are able to perform dimensionality reductions. Okay, uh, you can reduce from the say 10, 24 dimension into two dimensional, so that you're able to see them um, on the screens. So we use the TISMIS, it's a neighborhood preserving method, and also we explore the multi-dimensional scaling and isomap with different preserving techniques. For clustering, we use the DD scan, a, a density-based technique, and also use the k-means and algorithmative clusterings. I try to explore different combinations. So eventually, the best solution is actually using the TISNIS and the DD scans. Okay. And for the distance variation, we, we use three different ways. Uh, we actually compute the feature Euclidean distance uh, of, the, of the full net feature vectors. The other technique by using comparing string line, the MCP stands for the mean of forest point distance, and also using the string line house drop distance. Again, so the winner is actually just using the, uh, the feature vector Euclidean distance, give you the best uh, uh, qualities. So here we show you the a number of data set we explored in, and uh, uh, for, the, for the line, for the flow line or the string line, we Rendering, uh, when rendering tracing like 3,000 lines or 4,000 lines, uh, we're able to achieve a pretty good training score. If you look at F1 score for the training on the, uh, on the, on the left, okay, on the blue uh, box, under the blue box, and it's about 0.8 or above, okay? Uh, and for the testing, we rendering trace another pool of line and try to see how good it is. So basically the F1 score reported here showing that the, the network is not undefeated. And the bottom figure show you the same result for the surfaces. And we use 2,000 or 1,000 surfaces as a training and another two or 1,000 surfaces for the for testing. And we also do a quantitative evaluation uh, just to make sure that the network you train is not, under, uh, is not overfeeding, okay? So uh, on the left, we show you the training set onings. Again, we are able to explore a local neighborhood pool. You are able to see the nice correspondence of the flow line or flow surfaces. Again, similar line of surfaces, they are clustered together in the project space. In the middle, uh, we are showing you the test set only. And on the right, we are showing you the combination of both, where we put all those surfaces online uh, together for the both training and test set. And we are, you are able to see the nice um, Corresponding again here in the in the right image is showing that uh, the network is not overfeeding. So the network is not just barely remember what is learned. Able to take the new data and, and project it nicely. We also conduct quantitative variations. Okay, so we are looking at the big signal to noise ratios. And what we do is we 
as you find out the representative flow line, you are able to use that okay, uh, to reconstruct the underlying flow field. And we are able to compare that with the original flow field using a technique called gradient vector flow based, based on the idea of diffusions. And we are able to compute the uh, PSNR scores. Again, the higher the score, the better. So we are able to achieve almost uh, the best one uh, among the different methods being compared here. And this is the result for the, uh, we also compute the that we call AAD, the average angle difference, uh, just to see how how much variation each individual vector uh, you, you reconstruct it uh, compared with the original vector field. Uh, so the PS and R, the higher the, the better, right? So for the uh, angle difference, the lower value is the better. So we're able to get almost the best result uh, compared with the other state-of-the-art techniques. So here are some of the results for the, uh, so the, on the left, uh, the right side showing the projection view of uh, like 2,000 surfaces of the, uh, the solar plume data set. On the left show you the representative one. And this is the one for the tornado data set. Again, the user has the capability to interactively change in the number of clusters. So from top to bottom, you can select a different level of detail as, as you wish. And on the right is the selection of the, of the surfaces. So just to keep in mind, the result itself is not additive. So as you select more, uh, you may select a different set of uh, line of surfaces. And this is the set of results for the, uh, you are able to customize, allow the user to explore, customize the, uh, the, the string surfaces results. Okay, you are able to come up with uh, four different surfaces. Uh, and these are the representative string line selection results. So uh, we are pretty happy about this technique. Again, um, it's pretty generalized. It's not only taking line or surfaces. Anything like volume, you, have, you know, like 3D volume, you can use that to do the encodings. And uh, it provides uh, quite a bit of other possibility to, to continue work on this area. The second part is doing what we call vector field reconstructions. Uh, this is actually, uh, we are thinking in in situ visualization settings. Uh, where the simulation is running, so scientists normally can afford um, to output um, a small a subset of data set. Okay, so for the flow field, um, normally they just output maybe every, every hundreds of uh, uh, vector field, uh, every, every hundreds of time steps. They are able to, they are now able to afford to uh, save all the, all those time steps. So we are exploring here is that instead of uh, storing the vector field or compress the vector field, are we able to? store representative string line or a flow line, right? We are able to uh, generate those flow line in situ and compress those line as a sequence of data, okay? Uh, this provide a better way for us to compress the data and also uh, allow us to reconstruct the, the vector field with, with better uh, fidelities. So again, we are, perform or we are comparing our technique with the de facto standard, which is the gradient vector flow for vector field reconstructions. We are able to achieve higher quantities, reconstruction quality compared with the, uh, the compressed uh, vector field ideas. So we are using here is the, the idea we are using is we compress a string line as a sequence of data. There are uh, techniques like SC compression that can be leveraged and uh, which allow you to achieve a better PSNR uh, with the same compression rate. Um, so the reconstruction itself, basically uh, we're using the deep learning techniques. So the technique for reconstruction is actually two-stage techniques. Uh, so the first one is what we call the low resolution initialization. So we start with a random flow field, okay, and try to basically learn uh, from the input string lines, okay. So try to make sure that at those voxel locations where you have string, string line information that will match with the, uh, with the string line information. And this is the generally low resolution of flow field, and from there we use a convolution neural network to uh, go from low resolution to high resolution or original resolution. We are able to reconstruct high quality uh, vector field. And we have, in both states, we are using the mean square error as a loss functions. Okay. So this is the first stage. Again, we start with a random field and uh, iterate to update the low resolution vector field until it's produced the same velocity as the input string lines. So again, this is the original result. We are showing you maybe 200 string line here. And this is the first stage reconstruction result. Uh, once you have the vector field, we trace, again, 
You can either range and trace the flow field uh, using a different set of uh, seeding point or using the fixed tracing where the seeding point are those you know, on the original flow field you are using for the tracing. So um, this for the first stage. In the second stage, we actually um, go from low resolution to high resolution, uh, both idea from image super resolution and image completion. And we use the uh, convolution neural network to upscale uh, the vector field. Okay, so the goal is to fill the empty voxel through a nonlinear combination of the neighborhood. So you may ask why we wanted to go for two stage, right? So what if I just uh, take the representative string line uh, I compute in situ and then just go directly to the original uh, dimensions? So this is the experiment we attend. So if you directly uh, go for the original dimension, the result wasn't good. You are seeing a non-smooth result uh, in a region where, because the, the representative string line are really sparse sample of the domain. So for those regions of actual, you don't have the sample path through, the result wasn't very good. So, so that's not a good way to go. So that's why we do two stage. The first stage, construct a low resolution vector field. And the second stage, go from low resolution to high resolutions. Okay. So we're able to, uh, as you can see, the result compare with the reconstructed result with the original one. Uh, this pretty nicely matching the features in the original data set. You see a smooth string line. And also, the domain coverage is much better than using the, uh, compare with the, uh, you only stay at the low resolution where you don't have, uh, in our sample to reconstruct the, uh, the vector field around the, uh, the boundary of the domains. So the CNN we are using, uh, including several deconvolutional layer and the residual block. So the residual block is used to prevent the network from overfeedings and gradient vanishings. Okay. So the bottom show you the architecture of the uh, residual blocks. So it's all doing deconvolution. Basically, you are going from low res to the to the high res, and we evaluate the result uh, quantitatively. We compute the uh, reduction rate and the reconstruction big signal to noise ratios or with different number of string lines. Okay, so if you're using a small number of lines, uh, we are able to achieve a higher reduction rate, like 82 times the reduction rate of the original data. Uh, compared with the gradient vector flow, we are able to achieve better peak signal to noise ratio. Okay, so um, meaning the quality is better using the deep learning techniques. Well, certainly uh, the deep learning take more time to right, uh, to to do the training, taking hours on single GPUs. But the good thing is that it can be done in the offline and with better reconstruction quality. So it's pretty much across the line we are able to get better uh, the higher. PSNR value compared with the gradient vector flow techniques. And we also use the different compression rate okay, and evaluate the reconstruction uh, PSNR with the different error bounds. So if you specify a, a very small error threshold, um, the compression rate is relatively lower. Okay, so and uh, uh, you are able to preserve the, uh, the data quality better. If you're allowed to uh, compress more aggressively, right? So N is to achieve uh, less, you know, uh, the higher compression rate, but uh, the smaller PSNR values. Again, we're able to see that uh, our technique outperformed the gradient vector flow, which is the common uh, de facto standard for vector field reconstructions. And this one's showing you the error difference. Uh, again, if you've seen uh, the volumes, uh, we're able to show you the, uh, the Voxel, voxel by the arrows, uh, the blue representing the low arrows, the red representing the high arrows. You are able to see that. Uh, using our method, we are able to achieve low error compared with the, the gradient vector flows. Okay. And this, uh, the last result we are showing here is, um, so again, it's the idea of um, why don't we compare with, um, because in, in situ we are able to store the Representative, representative uh, like time step, just to compress the vector field directly. 
and use that later on offline. So we are comparing, this is the ground truth, and of the, of the vector field, we're able to find like uh, five different seeding points. As you see in the sphere here, we're able to trace the five different string lines from the uh, original flow field. And this is the one we use the SZ compression of the, uh, the underlying vector field itself, okay? So, and this is the one using the, uh, we are using the string line representation, okay? We are finding the representing string line in situ and, and compress the string line and use the compressed string line to reconstruct the vector field offline. So they have a similar uh, compression rate, but as you can see, the, uh, using the compressed string, uh, uh, compressed string line is actually better in terms of preserving the, uh, the flow feature and the patterns in the underlying vector field. Because if you just compress the vector field itself, a slight change in the individual vector may, may kind of perturb the, uh, the, the image, eventual integral line uh, dramatically. Okay, so to summarize, and so this is kind of the first attempt we, we do for the uh, using deep learning for, for scientific visualization in particular is in the flow visualization. Uh, it looks very promising, and uh, um, as you know, right, scientific simulation is not only working for a single time step, uh, normally it's a sequence of time steps, so from steady, we have unsteady data and also it's multivariate, not just single variables. And it has been, uh, we've been working with a lot of advancing deep learning techniques as well, right? So typically uh, from fully connected uh, network design to the convolutional network to the recurrent network, which uh, will work nicely for the time varying data. And also recent advance in the graph neural network actually allow us to maybe represent the data in a, in a more efficient way. So they are able to learn feature not just based on the uh, 3D, right, like the uh, binary representation of the, of the features. If you're using a graph-based neural you know, network, you are able to um, maybe learn more intrinsic feature, okay, like uh, the feature will be scale, rotate, and translate invariance. So let's provide additional opportunity to improve the the kind of work we are working on. And also we are looking into the adversary learning uh, using GAN and also transfer learning. This might be useful for uh, learning from the pattern from, from the single, va uh, single variable applied to the different variable of the same, of the same data set. So the ultimate goal we are looking at here is to uh, generalize the 3D feature learning framework, uh, make it more robust and also um, um, that's capture the invariant feature of the, of, the, uh, of the data set and go from the steady right, to unsteady flow uh, or the scalar field to vector field from time varying, uh, from single variable to time varying the multivariate data. Uh, but the eventual goal is to do what we call the data augmentations uh, for scientific visualization. So as a domain, uh, we are working in visualization, but we are not producing the data. The scientists provide us a limited amount of data. So, uh, Many times, you know, uh, they may able to compress the data and uh, give us a small subset. I'm able to use this uh, right data and to make a super resolution or make higher original resolution uh, to reconstruct the data. Uh, so that will be, uh, I think, open up a, a great direction, uh, at least for the field of visualizations. Okay, so um, I would like to acknowledge my students who have been working on those projects and uh, uh, collaborated at Aga National Lab and Notre Dame. Um, that's all. Thank you. And it, if you're looking at the uh, like unsteady data or time varying data, right? So we are exploring right now is to maybe using the first few segment of the data 
like the first 10 times that we're able to learn or train the data, and then able to use that to do the, for example, like the super resolution of for the later time step. So I guess as long as the data has some coherent, all the pattern, all the features that can be learned from early time step, uh, if you have enough information, you are able possibly to kind of predict or you know run a sequence, right? Extrapolate, not just interpret in between. So I think that's a possibility. Depend really depend on. Uh, kind of like how, how uniformly the data is distributed over the sequence or um, if you have something really unexpected at later sequence that's not been able to capture in, in the previous sequence that you are taking as a training, then it might not be entirely you know, possible. But I do see if the pattern going on, like theoretical patterns, then I think that's, a, that's certainly a possibility. Okay, thanks for Thank you. Oh, that's the picture of the